So good afternoon. I am Bill Wagner, this Twitter handle on the slide, so you can contact me afterwards any way you want. It's also my GitHub handle. So with any other questions, go ahead and go to the C Sharp Docs repo, and you can pose questions and ask issues there. So the title of this I chose rather deliberately. So we're, what I want to have happen out of this talk is I'm going to show you a variety of different things that you can do with the new features we've added into the C-sharp language that should make you more productive and should increase the quality and the clarity of the code that you write. So what that does mean is as I start each of the demos and I show some code that looks like it could have been written a few years ago, I don't want you to go back and go, oh no, I've got to rewrite all this. Because that code's probably been tested, it certainly works, it's certainly in a good spot. But as we've been evolving the language, we wanted to make that a little better. So, the idea behind this is if you think about computer languages, programming languages, they are all opinionated. They were designed by people who thought certain things and certain techniques and certain goals were important. Other things, not so much. So at the time of their design, in every instance, they come up with ideas that say, we believe this is the way you should write software, and this is how you should do it. And they made those things easy. But if you look at the arc of computer programming languages, they usually take a long time to get, get a lot of adoption. And once they do have a lot of adoption, they take a long time to stay in the industry because there is so much code out there that is using that language. So every programming language expresses opinions. In a lot of ways, the programming languages will have intentional opinions. We think this is a good way to solve these kinds of problems. Some languages, and probably every language in some way or other, has accidental opinions. Well, we didn't think about that, and now it's here, right? I mean, every language does, so I'm not gonna try to pick on any in particular here. Language expresses opinions by making some things easier and by making other things harder. And this is the thing that we're really wrestling with and trying to do as we continue to evolve the C-sharp language. If you look at the arc of our modern, more recent language releases, we have learned a lot of things as an industry since the initial design of C-sharp around 1999, 2000. So we wanna make it easier to create better software using the techniques people are recommending in general in 2020 and beyond. That is the only way the language will stay relevant. It's still gonna be an object-oriented language. That is where its roots are. We do not intend to take any features away because that would just be unwise. There's too much code out there. But we also have recognized and continue to recognize that things we may have thought were good ideas or may have thought were, well, this is easy enough in 99 or 2000, isn't easy enough anymore. So we want to make that better. So we are doing a lot of things to do, make it easier to work with different kinds of data. One of the things that we learned, you know, that it, if I look at the arc of history in computer languages, the advent of Java and C-sharp was because the industry finally realized after C and C++ and other languages like that, that managing allocated memory was a whole lot harder than anybody thought it was. C, yeah, malloc and free, how hard could it be, right? How many different bugs were because of that? C++, new and delete, and different kinds of new and delete, and so on, and smart pointers, and so on. Better, still a problem. We get to C Sharp and Java, these things are easier. But now when you look, there are still things that we did not make as easy as we could have, from things that we've now learned as an industry with the kinds of programs that we write now. So it's important to start to add those features. So, with that introduction, I'm really gonna spend the rest of the time looking at code and talking about the way we wrote things and the recommendations we had, and how we would go about doing that now, and different things we've added to the language that we want you to explore and to start to adopt as habits every time that you're working. So the first thing we're gonna learn 
is if you work in the area of, of computer languages, the only demos you're allowed to do involve points and a person class. <laughs> because they're easy to explain. I don't have to explain the domain. We know what a 2D point looks like. We know what a person object should be. And points let us work with value types very nice and easily. And person objects let us work with reference types. So I'm going to start with some things in our basic point class. I'm going to shrink this down a little bit they, after changing our thing. So I've got x and y, I can public getter, private setter. I know I can simplify some of this, and I will get to a fair amount of it. I have a design decision that I want to calculate the distance, but I want to calculate it lazily. So I've got a nullable double to um, store the distance, and I've got a property that retrieves the distance calculating it if I need to. I've got a constructor. I've got operator equals, operator not equals. Because of that, I have to overwrite equals. And I've got a git hash code that I'm not going to debate whether that's a good git hash code or not, but it's keeping the compiler happy. And then just because I want to make sure this is good for beginners, I'm going to show a neat little trick to get you through that entry-level programming interview where everybody says, I want you to swap these values, right? And you know, anyone has their first programming interview, it's like x equals y, y equals x, oh, you got it wrong. <laughs> you never had to write that code again, but just in case you do, I'm going to show you a neat trick. So in C Sharp 7, we added tuples. And we added them just so that it was an easy way not to have to write a class or a struct every time you wanted to hold more than one value, right? Because that was encouraging behavior that we didn't like, right? We want to keep these things together, but then I gotta write a class, I gotta put all these things in there, I've gotta define these methods, and now I suddenly got two pages of code just for something that didn't make a lot of sense. So we put in tuples. Turns out, once you have these, there's some really neat, fun tricks you can do. So let's start here with this constructor. It looks like a lot of constructors you would write for any of the types that you create. I've got a set of private fields. I've got a set of arguments that come in, and I'm going to set each private field to that argument. And depending on how many fields you have, you get this different line. This is this, this is that, that's that, and the other thing. Well, let's just write this in a real simple way now that I've got tuples. And I'm going to go x, where am I? x comma y comma distance equals, and let's change that to this.x because I gave him the same, the same casing, this.y, and that's going to equal x comma y comma distance, or comma default. And then I don't need these lines. OK? So I've just made one assignment that says, let's really temporarily just create this tuple that has the private fields that I want to initialize on the left side. And on the right side, let's just create another tuple that's got the arguments I want to pass to it. Okay, This is one of the ones we do not have a code fixer refactoring for. Uh, and there are a couple reasons for it. This looks good because it's got a total of three variables, and they're generally small. In practice, when I'm writing code and when I'm looking at different things, I will use this technique just about all the time with two arguments. I will often use it with three depending on the length of the variable names. Four starts to look dumb. So I usually don't do that, and then I would go back to separate statements. So if we were going to add a refactoring for this and there's a, a possible community project to do it, we would want to be able to go, go both ways to be able to say, take these separate statements and make it into a tuple assignment, take this tuple assignment, make it back into separate statements because classes have a way of growing fields occasionally over time. So there's that one. Well, now as soon as you see that, then you start to look at something and you go, this operator equal, equal looks like it should do something a lot like that. And if you've ever done code reviews, you may often see, depending on the thoroughness of your tests, that sometimes in one of these you might miss a left and a right, or you might miss the property names, because we, we copied and pasted this, right? Because that's what we do. So let's write it in a way that makes it just a little bit easier. So I'm going to go left.x, comma, left.y equals 
write.x and comma write.y. Boom. Okay. And then you see I don't need that extra and in there. I don't have to make sure I get the, that logic correct. It's just this tuple on the left that I quickly create, tuple on the right, quickly create, life is good. And we can do the same thing, of course, with the not equal. And then because people copy and paste code, you know that at least in somewhere in your code base, instead of the or there, there's an and, and it, the logic is wrong. And here I can just go left.x, left.y, and it's just should not equal right.x, comma, Write that Y. Cool. I like it. All right, so now that's just a little bit smaller. It's really clear what it means, though. That's just doing a couple little tricks with tuples, which we'll have a few more as we keep going through some other core themes. All right, now I said we had this swap chords thing. I know what we're going to do now. That's now going to be x comma y equals y comma x. Take that nasty interview person with your weird, stupid programming questions, because that's going to work. <laughs> OK. Um, sitting with John Skeet, he showed me a version of this where he does the same kind of trick with the Fibonacci sequence, and you get you know this dot current current next, it's kind of cool. So we start to do things like that, because the way we defined this, and we said we had to do this for the language, is it's going to evaluate all of the expressions on the right side to create that tuple, then evaluate the expressions on the left side to find the variables those things store in, and then do the assignments. So this will work correctly. And where we really needed that in practice other than for tricks like this, is to be able to show things like you could have expressions on either side, and things on the right side could change what happens on the left, and we needed to know exactly how that worked. Yes, so that's cool. So that's the first part. That's just a few little trips, tricks with tuples. Anytime you're looking at a couple, maybe three, sometimes four variables that you want to have travel together, go ahead and put them in a tuple and use any of these tricks. And again, none of these really do anything different than what we saw before with the old code. It is really a visual and a take a look at it and see if you like the way it looks for, each, for individual classes and individual structs that you're working with. You know, if you write this and you've got five or six things and it just looks bad, or if you've got some really long variable names and it looks bad, then don't do it. But this is just something when it provides more clarity to what you write, go ahead and, and do just that. So now, our next thing that I really want to talk about that we added, and this was one that was added in the seven point releases, where we did a lot of work to make it more, more better to write read-only structs. And we've been saying to make value types immutable since C-sharp 1.0, and that was all on all of you. So we really didn't provide a lot of support for that. So what we have done now, as let's say I said in my design, you know, this really should have been an immutable struct to store these points. I don't want them being modified once I've collected that data. They should be never changing. So now I can add the read-only modifier on the struct definition. So if I wanted this to be immutable, I would do that. And now the compiler is, you notice I've got red squiggles going out all over the place here because I didn't make it an immutable type in that any of the private member variables, the compiler now tells me those must be read-only. Because they weren't, this would not compile. Furthermore, anything that tries to set any of those read-only variables, well, those can't be, you know, that's bad too. You have said this was supposed to be a read-only struct. Now, the impetus behind this was performance in certain areas, in that now we want to be able to pass structs by references. We want to be able to do things like using span and reusing memory. And if the compiler can enforce the fact that a struct doesn't change and cannot be mutated, then that is a safer thing to do, because we can pass this struct by reference. We know it can't get modified, 
and it's safe when it comes back. Whereas if you pass something by reference and it could possibly be modified, the compiler is going to make a copy of it to make sure the code's correct. So before I make this completely read-only, this is where it gets to a lot of design decisions. Maybe I don't want the whole thing to be read-only. So let's annotate what we can and say, I know this method doesn't modify state. So, you know, getting the X chord, well, that should be read-only. So I can put the read-only modifier there to ensure that the get accessor does not modify anything inside this object. Okay, that may look redundant, but it really isn't. Because of property, we know executes code, so you could change state there. Again, we'll do the same thing with the read-only on the, on the Y. And then here on distance, right, that shouldn't change state, he said. So we'll write the read-only modifier on that property. Quick thing to note, if you have only a get accessor, you cannot put the read-only modifier on the get accessor. You have to put it on the property, okay? And if you notice, as soon as I do that, I'm now getting an error and another warning saying, you know, you can't do this because you said this was read-only, right? So by saying it was read-only, you're not allowed to modify the thing. And now you really have a design decision to make as to what you wanted to do if you wanted to make this completely read-only or if you wanted to still allow this lazy evaluation to go on. You know, let's say every time I create a point in this particular application, I'm always going to calculate the distance. Well, then I would probably move that calculation up into the constructor and really make this read-only and cache that value. Let's say you know, only one out of 1,000 points, I calculate the distance. Then maybe I don't want to pay that cost, and I would say, okay, I'm not going to make this read-only. And then note that because this is going at the get and set properties, it doesn't give me a warning here. It's going to just say the same thing. So it's here what we're trying to get at and what we want you to be able to do is any time that you're looking at a struct only, this read-only modifier cannot be added to classes. Anytime you're creating a struct, if your design was to make an immutable struct, add the read-only modifier on the struct. If it was meant to be only some things are read-only, then add it to those methods. So I'm going to finish this up because I do want to show one or two other techniques that we've added, is I am going to make this read-only, and then we are going to deal with some of these these errors, is now I'm going to use an implicit property here, and now I'm just going to say, well, this is just, just has a get accessor, and I am going to use the read-only property syntax. When you do this, whether it's in a read-only struct or not, the compiler knows the code it generates, and it automatically makes that property a read-only, as the read-only modifier to it in IL so that the CLR will know that that, that X property is um, a read-only, really read-only property. And we'll do the same thing with Y. I'm going to delete that. I love deleting code and getting features. And now that's, of course, going to be read-only as well. I could add the read-only modifier here if I wanted to, but it is redundant. It doesn't add anything. It's already there. So now I'm going to have to change how I do the distance. I'm going to remove the nullable attribute on it, and here I'm just going to do the same trick. I'm going to make this a get-only accessor. I'm going to get rid of all that, do this, and, you know, math.squareRoot um, x times x plus y times y, right? And again, you can see this gets just a little bit longer, and then this should be distance. And these become capitals because I need to use the properties. Okay, and now I have a truly read-only struct, and now I have to just remove that because that was done for a bug. Somebody was just any data backwards, so we needed that for a little bit. But now I have an, a truly read-only struct. Now. The point of this trick and the point of what I want to say is this should enforce what your design is. 
add these modifiers to enforce the design. It will communicate to other developers what you meant. Someone comes in here later and wants to add a method, and I'm like, well, the read-only modifier was probably there for a reason. Maybe I shouldn't add something to mutate state. Maybe I should do something to create a new point based on the existing data, however I wanted to modify it. So you communicate that design to others, and you communicate it to the compiler. The compiler will now help you enforce your design. Okay, now a little bit of a sneak as to our next trick, what we're going to do. The other big feature we added in C-sharp 8 is nullable reference types. And once you get to .NET Core 3.1, more and more of the base class libraries have been annotated so that the APIs now have the nullable annotations. So for instance, I have nullables turned on here, and if I have a method that looks like this, I'm now getting a green squiggle here, which is a warning. What that is telling me is, as of .NET Core 3.1, the equals override has now been annotated with object could be null, so it's an object question mark. Okay then, I have to put that there. Okay, this is one of the reasons why officially C Sharp 8 is not supported on older frameworks. While the nullable reference types feature, for one, is a big one, that it's implemented completely in the compiler, so the compiler would do the right thing, the older libraries have not been annotated, which causes two bad effects. You will get warnings at times when you shouldn't, and you won't get warnings at some of the times when you should. So because of that, it really doesn't help as much, and it really would provide kind of a false sense of security if you added this into your code and expect everything to be good, but you're not getting annotations from the libraries you use. Between now and .NET 5 and then .NET 6, we're gonna to continue to add more annotations into more of the .NET libraries based on how many, based on usage and download statistics that we have for which classes and which APIs get used the most, because it is quite a bit of work to annotate everything. So between now and .NET 5, .NET 6, as you start adopting C Sharp 8 and nullable reference types, with each new release, you may start to see a few new warnings because more APIs have been annotated. But that should be pointing out potential errors in your code. So we'd still want you, encourage you to start looking at it and start considering annotating your own code and turning this on where you can. So next I'm gonna to get to, as we talk about this and we start adding this, here's something that we've learned over the course of time. Nullable reference, ex or the null reference exception is the single most reported exception on any .NET app anywhere on the planet. It is more than double any other exception type that we ever see in any telemetry that we see. Looking at open source projects on GitHub, checking for null is the single biggest expression and work that people do in code. So let's do everything we can to make that more efficient so that you can add null checks without muddying the rest of your algorithms. And I'm gonna admit I'm totally guilty of this because I do a lot of work in docs and writing samples, and we often don't check for null because the more null checks we add, the harder it is to figure out the algorithm that we're trying to explain. So instead of writing the code you would really have to write in production, we trim some of these out, and we're, we wanna change that habit ourselves as well. And in doing this, we're going to do some things to add things to the language to make null checks not take so many lines of code. So let's look at our override of equals. It's right now, it sits in at about eh, 10 lines of code. There is really only one line of code here that has anything to do with the algorithm at all. And that's the one that calls our operator equals. That says, this is value-based equality, check to see if all the properties are equal, that's cool. The rest of it is all related to the null check. That's bad. That's then we go on. So let's try to shrink this out a little bit. So let's do this and say, all right, so this, if object is point other PT, we're gonna add some things with pattern matching. So I'm just gonna declare that here. And then, well now I'm just gonna return this equals that. Oh, I still need the bracket, sorry. Don't wanna get into that bug. And now I have that. Okay, so now I've, I've, sh I've shrunk that a little. I'm, I'm feeling a little better. It's a little bit more clear to see what you want. Okay, now this is one that 
it depends on how you like the ternary operator or not. But I can turn this into a single line expression and I can return obj is point other pt question mark. Boom. And if not, just return false. Okay. And I would usually try to format that like this. Okay, so now we have a very concise null check here. If object is a type of a point, if you've been a C sharp program for a long time, you knew that is for a long time only worked with reference types, not with uh, value types. Uh, it works with value types, and now we can say it is and has and, and assign it in the same statement. And then we're going to just check equality if that test succeeded. If not, and if it was null, it is not a point. So the is operator only returns true if the object is not null, whether it's a reference type or a value type. A null um, there would always return false because it's not an object, it's nothing. Okay, so there we go. Slightly simplified way of doing null checks. But to really do null checks, you know, remember I said I, I do either person classes or points. So, you know, now let's move over to the person type where we've got some reference properties. And we have the same kind of thing here. What I've got is I've got a person with first name and last name, and we've got, you know, more than half of this code is the null check stuff. Okay, thankfully though, if you look closely, you'll see three dots at the throw, because this is something we, we want to start encouraging, and we can say use a throw expression. What does that do? Oh, okay, so now if you look what this does, I'm gonna add a carriage return here to make this a little bit easier. And we may as well just change this to the, to the expression body members because you know the brackets are just taking up space for no apparent reason. And I now have a set that says, all right, so first name equals value, and then a double question mark, which is null coalescing operator. And if value happens to be null, then throw a new argument null exception. Okay, so I like that. I also like the way IntelliSense did that for me. Another little trick here that is my single biggest complaint about API consistency in the .NET libraries is argument null exception, the parameter name is first and the message is next. In the argument exception, they're reversed. Thank you very much. <laughs> so in all cases, if you look at our docs, what we try to do is we try to use name parameters even though we often put them in the normal order. And then in order to make sure refactoring works, we use the name of uh, operator for the param name, just because then if I refactor this and I change the name of the argument, that code will also be refactored. So we can do the same thing here in this next one. I've got the same kind of thing. Cool. Hit our light bulb and use the throw expression. Oh, hey, I can do it here in, in my constructor too. I'm now feeling really good about this. Come on. Um, and I can do the same one there. And if you notice that I did all the null checks first and then the assignments, and this refactoring knows enough to start to move those around and see those anywhere in a method. So with most of the methods that you'd write, you do something like I'm gonna test all the arguments first and then I'm gonna go on and I'll do more things later. The next one that I wanna look at here is we added a method onto this person class to hyphenate last name for a partner. So I could do A dot hyphenate B, or depending on how the partners wanted to switch, I could do B dot hyphenate A and get a new last name that has the concatenation of those. And you can see I have to check to see if partner is null. And if it's not null, I'm gonna do this work to set last name. And if it is null, I'm gonna throw a null argument exception. Now I wrote this in a slightly different way because I wanted to show something very important about the way the warnings get generated. Remember I said earlier in this project I have turn on, turned on nullable reference types and I have all the warnings turned on. So if you look at this argument, this person argument, it should be and it is declared to be a non-nullable reference type. 
Okay, so if I delete this null check, I just want to delete the null check. Okay, I am not getting any warning, any errors or warnings to say you might be dereferencing something that's null here. This is not good because I've declared it to be non nullable. I'm going to put the null checks back. And I'm going to point out that with your code, when the compiler looks at anything that you've annotated with null reference types, it pays attention to what you're doing. And it does do a thorough static analysis of your code and what you've already written. So this partner is a non-nullable reference type. But down here, if I do a console.write line and I could do partner.last name, okay, now there it is. I now have a warning under partner, the green squiggles. That is a nullable reference warning, and if I hover over it, it is going to say, you know, this, you might be dereferencing null here. Okay. Even though the type was declared, the argument was declared as a non-nullable reference type, because you added this null check, the compiler goes, I bet you did that for a reason, crazy human programmer. So because you did that for a reason, and this line of code, this console.write line, is not inside the block where you have checked it against null, maybe it really is null here. So I'm not going to trust the type system quite so much right there. And that's sort of the key to what non-nullable reference types are. They are annotations on variables. It's not a new type. And we're doing static analysis of the code to determine should we issue a warning here. So as you're adding things, when you have null reference checks, those will affect the static analysis. I am not encouraging you to remove null reference checks, just so you know. But I am pointing out what will happen with warnings. However, there is a neat trick that we can do to make these null reference checks simpler. Again, I'm going to want to throw this null reference exception if, if this is bad, so I'm going to move this up here. I don't want to do a null reference check with this if stuff because this is just, it's really old school. But what I'm going to want to do is I would like to use that same kind of a throw expression. But if you look at that line of code where I do the return, I'm just using person. I don't really need to assign this to anything. So I'm going to use a discard. I'm going to say discard equals partner or throw that null reference exception, argument null exception. Okay, so the discard here is a special uh, token that says if I don't already have a variable named underscore there, this looks like a variable, but the compiler can throw it away and, in fact, does not store anything to it. So this is something that we think is, is going to be idiomatic that we would like to encourage people to use more and more, which is if all you're really trying to do is check to see whether an argument or a field or whatever is null, assign that field to a, a discard. And when you have it, and if the right-hand side of that assignment is null, add the question mark, question mark, throw, and that's a null check. Now, the reason to do this, you know, we talk kind of about writing less code, and I, and I really think that that's less important than making your actual algorithm stand out more clearly. The original version of this was about four lines long, and more than half of the code in it was a null check and the throw. We've now changed that null check into a single assignment statement with an expression on it. And then, while this is a one-line method, so it is reasonably simple, whatever else you're doing now becomes the code that you would really look at, right? So what we're trying to do is make it so these, these techniques that we have to use all the time just to ensure our code is correct and things don't crash and we don't get calls at, at weird hours takes up less of the code so that we can see that it's correct and we can really concentrate on the logic that we've written. So for the last larger set of demos that I want to work with is dealing with pattern matching, which is something that we think is a really better way to write a lot of the algorithms that we have to write. As we're working with data, as we're working with data of different types and different properties, and we're 
bringing in data from different places, possibly as JSON packets, either from REST or GraphQL, and maybe looking at it and parsing it, we need to create different object types and so on. So the idea behind this is this is part of a system that does toll calculations. So I'm gonna start with this set of comments. So imagine a large metropolitan city. It shouldn't be too hard right now. Um, and we want to discourage traffic at times that there's already an incredible amount of traffic. So there's a toll system that does, charges people to use the roads at peak times. So the business people have come up and they've said, all right, so here's what we're gonna do. On the weekends, tolls are just its normal cost. If you go overnight on a week night, well, that's when we want the lorries to do the deliveries and so on, so we're gonna even lower it further. So if it's the wee hours of the morning, you only pay 75% of the normal toll. Daytime, so not rush hour, but after morning rush and before afternoon rush, well, it's still pretty busy in the city, so it, you pay one and a half times. If you're morning rush going into the city, it's double. Evening rush going out of the city is also double. Okay. So I made a few small, um, I made an enum for morning rush, daytime, evening rush, overnight. Is weekday, okay, this is a pattern matching switch expression. Okay, so if you squint at it, it kind of looks a little bit like a switch statement, but these are all expressions. So you know the lambda arrow and the right hand side is always an expression. It is not a set of statements or a block and there's no break. We did switch the order, and this is so that you can chain them. I can make the output of one switch feed into another switch expression, because then that makes it a little bit more fluent. So I'm gonna take what day of the week is it, and I'm gonna switch on that value. So that's an enum in the daytime class, daytime struct, that of course has Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I'm gonna say if it's Saturday or Sunday, well, it's not a weekday. Anything else, which is this discard character in a switch statement, is match everything else, well then it is a weekday, so return, uh, return true. This is a really good way to look at bits of data and make a determination about the values or the properties or the types of that data. In this instance, I'm making a determination based on the values of an enum. So here when I did the time band, well, this talks about how we're, we are still innovating and we are still gonna add more. We don't have a range pattern. Patterns have to be a particular value. So if I take the hour, I would need 24 rows here to match every different possible value, zero through 23, and that would look really ugly. So here I am using some nested ifs. One of the proposals that we're looking at right now is a range pattern that would say if hour was between you know, zero and six or between six and 10, you know, and we're looking at a way to add that which would simplify this code. So again, going back to what I said at the very beginning, this isn't necessarily go rewrite all your code to use pattern matching. Look for places where it would make sense. Speaking of places where it would make sense. So let's look at an imperative way to calculate that multiplier. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check to see if it's a weekday. If it is a weekday, I wanna look if you're going into the city. If you're going into the city, then I wanna look, is it morning rush, is it daytime, is it evening rush? Oh, it's something else, so it must be overnight. Okay, this else matches inbound, so now you're leaving the city. So let's get the time of the toll. I'm already off the page, so I made the same call again. I could probably refactor this, but this is already really long, and I wanted to remember what it was. And again, is it a morning, what is it in the evening, what is it overnight, and so on. And then we get back to this last else, oh, that's the weekend, so the multiplier is one, okay? This code does not fit on one page. It ends on line 95, it starts on line 46. So we have almost 50 lines of code. And yes, I know I'm following some coding standards that have braces, we could remove the braces and we could shrink it, but that leads to bugs, so we're not doing that. That 50 line method is implementing those, what? Six lines of business requirements, including the comment that says this is exactly, these are the business requirements. So five different business requirements, 50 lines of code. It's not good. 
Business people are now going, well, now, how much did you test this? Did you go through everything? How do you, are you sure? This is something where we can really use pattern matching. So we'll go ahead and implement this here from the pattern matching bit. So I repeated the same business requirements here. And now if you look at this, once again, I'm going to use those tuples because now I've got three variables I'd like to make into one thing. But I'm not going to define a class to hold whether or not it's a weekday, which time band is it, whether or not you're going into or out of the city. So I just made a tuple out of those three variables here on line 106. I've got is weekday time of toll, get time band time of toll, inbound, then I've got the switch. And now I can build a table with all the combinations of all those values. Copy and paste helped here, and I didn't want you to watch me type all that, but so there is, this is what I need to fill in, those lines. Don't take a picture yet, I, it's all zero, it's, this is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first thing I can do is I look at my requirements and go, all right, so the weekend, everything should be 1.0, great. So I'm gonna start here at the first falls, um, Handy little Visual Studio trick. If you press down Alt, you can select on a column. So I'm gonna just select this one column down to there. Not quite there, that's close enough. And I'll just delete that one. And then I can just write the one in there. Okay, that's cool. So now I filled in half the table. Life is good. So now I've got, okay, so what did I say daytime was? I said daytime was always gonna be one and a, one and a half. Yes, daytime is one and a half. Okay, great, so I need a five here, and I need a five here. Morning rush, if I'm going into the city, is double. If I'm going out, it's the same. Overnight, oh, that was my 0 0.75, because you get a discount for the lorries going in overnight. And then evening rush, I said that was gonna be, oh wait, I just messed this up, didn't I? These are. So, I was already in the wrong row. That should be, those were supposed to be the zeros. That's still the weekend. Okay. And then up here, I've got evening rush. Going home is two. Going in is one. Daytime, I said that was going to be 1.5 for both of them. Great. Morning rush going home, or leaving the city is one. Going in is two. Okay, great. Now I've got that. That's... That's not, not that hard to really comprehend now, right? I've got 12 rows, it's not bad. Yeah, okay. But we can still simplify this a fair amount. And again, here, I would really look at the code, look at the options that you have, look at how many rows you have, how many different values you have to decide how far to go down this next set of refactoring I'm gonna do. Everything on the weekend back here with the falses, well, that's all, all 1.0. I don't care what any other value is. So I'm just gonna add a row here that does false, don't care, don't care, and that is gonna be 1.0. Okay, now, notice how I get the red squiggles on all of the lines below it. This is, will help you test if you're doing any of these refactorings to see if you got it right. By doing any of these refactorings, what the warning or the error is in all of these says, this switch arm was already handled by something above it. So there's no way to execute this code because the statement above it, it's always gonna get handled. Okay, that was exactly what I wanted, so that's good. Now I can take these and I can delete them. Cool. Turns out if I wanna be really fussy, I can make this just another discard because, well, once I've handled all the true cases, I don't care. Okay, but we'll wait to do that one last. Now, there's a couple other ones I can do here. If I look, anything overnight is that 0 0.75. So whether it's true or false, I can replace this with a discard, okay. And if I do that, this one should turn red, cool. That was exactly what I wanted. Okay, and then, oh, hey, anything at the daytime, that's also one and a half. I can do that, cool. And then this one should turn red. There we go. That's done. Okay, that's nice. Cool. Okay, I don't like the way this looks. It's, it's correct. It's about as simple as I can get it. But, you know, I'd like to kind of just, yeah, let's just move this one up here. And we'll leave the 1.0s together. Okay, and then I've got the ones that have some of that. 
Since it didn't add any squiggles, well, OK, I'm OK. I put them in an order that still works. So now we took this thing that was 50 lines of code that was very imperative, if, then, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, that, the other thing, all with one line branches. And we said, you know, I can turn that into, first it was 12 rows, and now it's down to six rows. And the real kicker that I want is not the amount of code that you're writing and how much of this there is, but how clear is that versus how clear is that? And admittedly, this is a little bit of a contrived example, and you should play with this a little bit to figure out what works in your code and in your code bases. But a lot of times when we're looking at properties, looking at types, or looking at values of data, and we are making decisions on an algorithm, this is an incredibly powerful tool to use. And the more I've started to play with this, and the more I've started to use it, I find myself going, I really want to reach for this tool very often. OK? So as we're getting close to the end, I'm going to end with one really small quiz. I don't want anyone to speak up with this, but I'm going to write a routine. And this routine is going to have a bug in it. And when you spot the bug, I want you to raise your hand. So now this toll people, the business people have come back and said, all right, this system is working, but we want to kind of reward people who are really regular and following things. So we're going to allow people to get a year-long subscription and pay in advance. It gives us some cash up front. We like that. And then you know, they can you know, be like frequent drivers and do something better. So I'm going to make a public static method that's going to return a date time for the start and a date time for the end. And the method is going to be called uh, generate subscription. And what it's going to do, well, we need to figure out the start. Start's going to be today. So var start equals date time dot now dot date. And you know, it's going to expire one year from now. So I'm going to do var end equals new date time. I'm going to do start dot year plus one, start dot month, because it's the same date, right? Start dot day. OK. All right, I'm seeing tragically few hands come up. So to make sure everybody can see the code well, I'm going to leap over here. This is a bug that's going to show up one month from yesterday. There are not enough hands up at that. That was a pretty good hint. OK, so everybody's got that. What is this going to do that's going to be really bad? Anybody raise their hand really early? Go ahead. Hmm? On the 29th of February 2020, this is going to crash because there is no 29th of February 2021. Now, the point of this little quiz is date time math is really, really hard because this is probably the most obvious example, and I did it here today because it is very timely. Um, so, a better way to do this, keeping this one fairly simple, is start dot add years one, okay? Because the dot net frame, oh, and I need to add the return. Start end. And the reason I did that, added that there is now the date time struct and any good date time library is going to handle all kinds of conditions, whether it's a leap year, whether it's years that end in double zero that you'd think are leap years but aren't. Uh, going on and going off summertime if you're doing math around hours, um, and so on. If you're doing really extensive stuff around culture, John Skeet's Nota Time open source library is incredibly powerful and does a lot more for a lot of reasonable things. It's built in a date time. But I did this in, in particular because I would actually look at your code a little bit and maybe do a quick search to see if you're just doing your own date time math and try and replace it with something that's probably tested. OK, so that's the code as we get close. So the new habits. The reason we went through all of these things and the reason I did some of this, a little lighthearted, but focusing on a few different areas. 
fun with tuples. Anytime you find yourself going, I'm carrying a few bits of data, and I really don't want to do all the work to make a struct, think about using tuples. There's also a proposal that we're working on for records, which would be a very, very shortened, better, simpler syntax to actually create a type if you needed it. Read-only members and read-only struct. <coughs> Declare your intent when you're writing structs and value types and let the compiler enforce that and communicate it both to the compiler and to everyone who's gonna read and maintain your code. Has a better chance of being correct over the long haul. The examples I was showing where I was doing the um, question mark, question mark initializations and other things like that, the technique we refer to that as is not null by initialization. So the more often you can ensure that a field or an argument or a variable is initialized to something that is not null as soon as you declare it and create it at that point in text. Then you know that variable is never null and you can declare it as a non-nullable reference type and you will, the compiler will help you spot those errors. Remember that those are just in metadata. So especially in public APIs, especially as you're in this process where you're probably migrating some code and some of it hasn't been annotated, check for nulls anyway, and especially in public APIs. Um, as I said, anything that we're doing where we're annotating APIs, I can guarantee you we are not removing null checks. Patterns and data. Anytime you find yourself like switching on things and doing a lot of if then else, some kind of logic by looking at a property, looking at a type, consider pattern matching. It is a different way of thinking about a problem, but it is a very, very powerful way for certain classes of problem. This is not to say stop using object oriented, stop using inheritance. Would never want to say that. But if you looked at those algorithms that I wrote, I really didn't have an inheritance hierarchy to work with. Would have been really cumbersome to make one. That switch expression was actually much more powerful and a lot more clear in a smaller space for exactly what the code was doing. And that's what we're looking for. And then the classic, like I said, just really a reminder, date and time math. And what I would make the recommendation here is do what you can to follow the good engineering, software engineering practices that you're doing for your applications. Right, I'm sure all of you are building some kind of a culture of trying to write good software. When that feels cumbersome, do a little bit of research. See if there's a better way to follow the really good practices without writing quite as much extra code. Specifically, look for some new features and recommendations. I used the light bulb today, and there's also a screwdriver icon for other recommendations for a purpose. If you're using Visual Studio, then you will get hints on some of the things that we think we've added features that you may not know about. Check that light bulb on the screwdriver. And I meant this bit about talking about looking for the new research and do some research. We love Stack Overflow and we love that it helps me every day too. But very often now what we're finding, because .NET's been around for about 20 years, is there are answers that have 15 years of upvotes. And they were great, perfect answers for a long time, and we've added features to make that, yeah, this will work, but you know, there's a better way to do it. And the better way has maybe six months of upvotes. So it's harder to find it. And like Tess was talking about in her opening keynote uh, yesterday, that's a positive feedback loop. People keep seeing that first answer and using it, even though there may be a better way. So when I say do some research, take a little bit more time, including Stack Overflow. We're trying very hard to stay up to date on docs. And, uh, Check the recommendations from the IDE to try to find some slightly better things. And use the things that we're adding to build some new, build some new habits. Um, Aka.ms slash new C sharp is where it's gonna point to the latest C sharp stuff. Um, I'm gonna particularly call out two things that I put in here. If you go into the sample browser, which is docs.microsoft.com slash samples, and search for Explore C Sharp, you will see any of the things that we have that are going to help you explore some new things in new areas. Yeah, that one I didn't want to show. Ah, where did I, thought I put this? Um, another thing that we are doing is we have started adding a .NET Docs What's New page. So every month we will be publishing you know, what's really big and new. 
And as a bonus, because we're all open source, we are recognizing everybody who contributed to Docs in the last month by their GitHub IDs, and if they have added their name to their GitHub profile, we will put it there. But we don't dig any deeper than that. Um, and if you look at our tutorials, the toll calculator is part of a much larger application on pattern matching that will take you through a lot more techniques that you can use there. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm sure everybody's excited to get to the reception, but I will be up here for any questions. Uh, you can ask me questions now. I think we've got a couple minutes left. And thank you very much for your time.